All right, so I just see my clock just turned two. I wanna welcome everybody to session four, which is demonstration of data sets. And it will consist of five excellent talks by a great panel of speakers. Um, each speaker will have about 15 minutes. Um, so for the speakers, please try and keep your talks to about 13 minutes. Uh, so that way we can have about two minutes for questions and comments after. And I will give a warning at around 11 minutes to provide a time update. Um, so to kick it off, um, let's start with Jason English, who will be talking about using PointStat to compare DOE ARM flux data to RFS NWM model output. Jason, I'll throw it over to you. Okay, great. Um, so I'll do presentation mode, right? That's correct, yes, please. Okay, I'll try slideshow. Can you see the screen? I can, it looks great. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, using some of the MET Plus tools to um, process DOE ARM data um, and compare to model output. I um, started this just a couple weeks ago and unfortunately ran into some foreseen and unforeseen issues, so I don't have results yet. So what I want to do is talk through my planned approach and some progress and then would love to hear people's feedback and ideas on that um, to help kick me off in the right direction and also make this a uh, flexible tool that could be used for, for other purposes as well. Um, so the project need that I have is um, I'm working on a newly coupled Rufus National Water Model models. So the um, Rufus is the Rapid Refresh Forecast System. Um, it is, um, I'll, I'll talk about the, the model details in a second, but um, one of the questions we want to ask, answer is, is to evaluate the model, how accurate are its surface fields, both from forecast and analyses. And some fields are easy that we commonly evaluate, like two meter temperature and 10 meter winds. And for example, um, we already have, um, some output set up in our MATS system, which uses some MET products. Uh, but some fields are tougher, um, shortwave, shortwave and longwave fluxes and latent and sensible fluxes uh, don't have a whole lot of um, available observations as well as tools to compare them. So DOE armed stations across the Southeast United States do report these. Um, and so what, what tools should I use to compare this Rufus National Water Model output to DOE ARM data? And um, one approach um, that may work out well is to use some of the MET Plus tools like point stat, stat analysis, and possibly the MET Viewer. Um, to do that, um, would likely use a Python wrapper to process and input the DOE ARM data to point stat. The wrapper could be written to be adaptable to other fields from the DOE ARM data set. Um, so a qu quick, quick uh, overview of the Rufus National Water Model. Um, Rufus is the next generation high resolution weather model. It's, it's um, based on the US, UFS community framework, has the FV3 dynamical core, um, CCPP physics, which is part of the, the community. Um, it has three kilometer grid spacing, which is the same as the operational HER. And um, the goal is to replace the operational HER with Rufus and um, next year, hopefully. Now, the National Water Model is a state-of-the-art water model, um, which has been used for the HER before um, with the HER, but um, has never been coupled to our um, developmental version of the Rufus. And so this is the first time we've done that. We've successfully done it. And now we want to look at our model output. Um, the, uh, this Rufus National Water Model output is similar to the HER in that you can have grid 2 and net CDF output. Now the DOE ARM data sets, here's, here's a link if you want to look at them, but um, there's a variety of um, clusters of locations for the DOE ARM data. Um, I list them here. Um, the one that I'm most interested in is the Southern Great Plains, partly because it's of interest in, in the project I'm on um, to look at convective impacts on the coupled Rufus National Water Model. model. 
Um, but also, Southern Great Plains is the only site that um, reports a significant amount of latent and sensible heat fluxes. And, and also, SGP is one of the only sites that has shortwave and longwave fluxes. Um, you can click on this link if you want to see the website, but it's a pretty nifty website and provides a variety of data format options, including uh, uh, NetCDF or the older CDF. Um, or ASCII. And this is just a quick look at what the ARM site looks like. And I selected latent heat flux. Um, only SGP provides it. There's a variety of sites that do that. And then you can check out the data and download it. So to, to now, now to move on to the MET use of it. Um, so what do we, what do we want to do here? So we have the Rufus National Water Model output, which is in gridded forecast data. Um, then we have the DOE ARM data, which can either come out as ASCII or NetCDF. Um, so since NetCDF is getting us closer to, to what we need to work with the MET tools, I'm going to download the NetCDF and work with that. Um, and then point stat and stat analysis are two existing tools in this, the MET suite that um, would likely be useful here. So the, the proposed approach is to use point stat, process DOE ARM data in the format usable by point stat, confirm um, the, the output, the existing output from our Rupus National Water Model and group two files are accessible, set the configuration file and then run point stat. And then from that output can do stat analysis, a variety of um, types of analyses we want, um, plotting visualization would be nice, and that's a, a next step that I um, don't have much details on yet, but could um, possibly use MetView or Maps. And then, as we heard earlier today, there's the value in documenting and making code available. So the plans are to, to, to do that, especially if I can make it um, tailorable to, for a broader community use. Um, so um, a quick look. So if I'm interested in latent heat fluxes, um, this is what the GRIB2 file output looks like in the Rufus National Water Model. It's basically in the Lambert conformal um, lat long um, coordinate system. Um, and it's in watts per square meter. Um, and there's an output file for each um, valid time and forecast hour, but it's two dimensional um, fields. Now the DOE ARM site, um, there's a NetCDF file available for each site at each day, and the it's one dimensional um, and has um, 30 minute increments of time, and it's again um, also in watts per square meter. So what I want to do is re read um, this DOE file in and um, process it into a format usable by point stat. So the, the progress and status here is um, I had, uh, had to take some time last week to um, get Met Plus and Python working again on JET. There was a, a variety of changes that had occurred the last few months. Um, we had a new um, way of doing modules where we have to do the um, specific versions on JET. And then we now have um, Python mini conda environments that we need to set up because only certain Python modules are easily available unless we do our mini conda environment. And I have that in place. And so then now it's to process DOE ARM data for point stat. Now this is in progress and this is where I'd um, like some feedback from people. Um, but to create a Python wrapper to re read and write the DOE ARM data, I see, um, and, and John Galway had helped me a bit um, looking into this, but in the community, um, Howard So had created a couple of files here, met point obs and read met point obs, which create um, from obs point observations of met, met CDF file. And what I want to do is, um, I think, um, modify these files for the DOE ARM site. And I'm not going to, this is a lo lot of, a um, um, a lot of words here, and I and I don't want to read through each line, but this is um, from the read met point obs file. Um, so it reads um, in the the file and processes it. And here's the observation file on this side, this part of the code. 
Um, this is the, the read wrapper. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking in from this um, script met point obs. So the met point obs um, has this main line in the main line code is um, get sample point obs and get point data. And so the get point data here has um, the uh, has this code that um, I just included because um, that's to be complete. But I wanted to talk about the next um, piece, and that there's this definition um, that provides a, an array of lats and longs. And I think what I will do is is modify these for the um, DOE arm sites and input their Latin longs into here. Um, but I, but again, I, I would like feedback from people. So um, really, so where I'm at um, is I'm still in the, the approach process here. And um, is the best approach to modify these two Python wrappers that are existing on GitHub, um, wh which parts to modify. Um, and also um, point a question for the, the organizers or community is um, I see that point stat configures uh, configuration file specifies level but I'm not sure about how a Latin long goes into there um, so like I see here that the configure file can have um, a variety of inputs in here um, so I'm is it at a certain lat long or is lat long already um, averaged um, and then finally, uh, determining the best types of plots to compare um, and does some of our existing tools enable them easily. Um, so um, so I'll, I'll just end it there and look for any um, comments and suggestions and questions. And hopefully over the next several weeks, I can get um, progress on this and we'll get it into to GitHub eventually um, for others to use as well. Jason, thank you for an excellent talk. I see Marion has raised her hand, so I'll throw it over to Marion. I don't hear you. If I can, I'll mute myself. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, great, um, um, great example, uh, Jason. I did miss the very beginning of it because I was struggling to get into the meeting. But um, I mean, getting an, a wrapper with the ARM data sounds like really um a really good step forward i think so we're really interested in figuring that out i think we're a little bit behind you because we're still trying to figure out what on earth to do with the arm data itself and navigating around the website but you know there's also the fluxnet data which we're also looking at which is a different set of you know data but you know i think is similar in in in, in design or content um so yeah maybe we can keep uh, you know uh, interacting on this yeah and, and that's actually a bit of a philosophical question here is it better to um, create some scripts that can read in a variety of flux data from different sources mm -hmm. like FluxNet and arm or is it better to have um, a wrapper that can read in the DOE ARM data, and then you select which type of data you want if you want. Flux. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, which almost requires a software engineer's take on it. <laughs> and if anybody wants to really say it, but um, maybe having a nice clean use case might be good. But you know, yeah, it's you can you can probably argue it both ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, th thank you. I see John raised a hand too. Yeah, Jason, I wanted to I point out, I, I saw your, your email from last week and will respond um, about the issues you're running into. Um, here's the, you know, based on discussions in, with um, with folks on the Net Plus Slack channel from Dave Turner, we did write up this issue to, with the idea of enhancing MET to support the, the ARM data um, and ask it and see directly. Um, but this is, a, so this was an example of a good idea um, but it's just, it's assigned to the backlog of development ideas milestone, which means we don't have any immediate funding or, or plans to do the work right away. We just wanted to capture capture the idea. 
So Marion, if you see utility in this and what as well, um, you folks can always add comments to existing issues to say, boy, I'd really like to see this functionality too. We need to figure out a way to how how to how to do, how and when to do it, that sort of thing. I don't imagine it would be very difficult. Um, but of course, you know, as Jason's doing now, doing it with Python embedding is is the the alternative that exists today. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. I will go and now search for the uh um is it a discussion or an issue? If I put the issue, the link to the issue in the chat. Okay, cool. I will I will I will I will put my words of support there. Excellent. Well, Jason, thank you for a great talk and for generating some nice discussion and some potential collaboration. Uh, with that, we will move on to the next talk of today's session um, by Shiwei Wei, um, who will be talking about evaluating the NOAA aerosol real analysis version one with MET Plus. So I will throw it over to you now. Yeah. So can you hear me okay? And can you see my screen? I can. I can see your screen. And now okay. it's in presentation mode. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. And my name is Shi Wei and I'm a, I'm a PhD student from uh, SUNY Albany. And uh, today in my presentation, I will cover about uh, how we use the MEPLAS to evaluate the first uh, acid aerosol reanalysis product at NOVA for the version one product. And I will like to take this opportunity to thank all the help from MEPLAS group, especially from George and John. They, they provide a lot of help when I develop the evaluation package for our uh, aerosol analysis product. <coughs> so for today's uh, presentation, I will cover, uh, I will share, introduce the background information about the uh, know our aerosol acid and then which is then uh which is uh, uh, uh as the in short is a uh, nara and uh, next part i will cover some uh, evaluation how uh, of of the uh, performance of from the nara product which come from uh, two aspects one is for horizontal 2d statistics and then another aspect is uh, regional uh, vertical profiles and then the time series. And then this part is about the summary about this uh, product and uh, for future work. Yeah, so NARA is actually the very first uh, aerosol analysis product in NOVA. And it actually is a, a collaborative uh, effort between NOVA GSL. Uh, NASA GML and the SUNY Albany ASRC. Which, uh, yeah. And in this uh, reanalysis product, uh, right now we produced the 2016 aerosol reanalysis. And uh, um, it's a, the analysis is based on the uh, JDA uh, based aerosol DA system, like I, uh, the flow chart shows here, which is an ensemble variational analysis system. And within this system, uh, we the forward model we actually use a guest aerosol, which is current uh, one single member in the uh, one single member in the global ensemble forecast system, and which is coupled with the go kart parameterization to handle the chemistry uh, forecast. So within this analysis, then we actually uh, Use the uh, uh, 40 members to create the the big uh, the big one error uh, estimation for the uh, analysis, and in and we assimilate the MODIS LD from Terra in Aqua to get the base estimation for our uh, aerosol field. Within this system, we also use the the JDI component UFO to handle the. Uh, simulation of the LD and LD to, to get uh, based on the, the lookup tables from CRTM and the, the NASA so to get to get the uh, analysis. Yeah. And regarding the evaluation package part, we uh, we use MEPAS as we <laughs> that's why we are here. So um, so we evaluate the performance of our NARA uh, by against the 
NASA's uh, MIR-2 and uh, the ECNWS Ken Kensira, uh, both are uh, uh, aerosol reanalysis products from, uh, from both are aerosol reanalysis products. And so basically we will have uh, our, our own analysis, reanalysis aerosol field in the graded format uh, as a forecast data and then analysis data is graded uh, also graded from the ECNW and the NASA. And for the 2D map evaluation, we actually generate some statistics like the bias lumen square error and the mean absolute errors, which is uh, calculated through the series analysis. I will uh, uh, introduce more later. And then, so for another part, it's for regional profiles and the time series evaluation. So for this part, we actually pre-generate the max files for each region with using the, the gem uh, VX uh, max list utility to create a, a bunch of uh, uh, interest regions for us to calculate statistics. And then we apply the grid state and the state analysis to gather our uh, results, the statistics. So here's a, an example for the uh, horizontal distribution of uh, July 2016 uh, monthly mean for the LD statistics. So the left column is the LD errors up to death from the CAN0 and the MIR2. And then the middle panel is, uh, middle column is the, the LD biases from the uh, narrow one, for narrow one. And then the right panel is the uh, free focus LD basis. So give us a little bit of flavor to, uh, to see how the LD observation can help, can help the analysis, aerosol analysis. So for this part, uh, we actually, uh, in the beginning, we actually use the NCO tool to split the neural tool file. So if, when we download the MIR2 file, it actually uh, one file contains uh, multiple time uh, uh, dimension, uh, multiple time data. So, so we actually originally we need to use the NCO tool uh, to split it into, uh, uh, make it like uh, become one single time of uh, one single time per file, and then run a series analysis. But last year we heard some. Uh, that the grid state can also handle the multiple times data. So we modify, we change our configuration for the series analysis. But we, uh, we got no luck, it, it actually fails and it cannot create uh, the statistics, uh, statistics correctly with the series, uh, series analysis for the multiple time file. So we, Ask for help from the GitHub discussions, then um, work with uh, George uh, a lot to, and he, they, they finally introduced the capability to handle the, uh, this kind of issue that uh, we have a one time per file uh, forecast file, and then uh, versus the multiple times per uh, obs uh, observation file. So, in a series analysis wrapper. And this capability become available in the version 4.1. And with, with this, uh, this, after this version, we actually, uh, we can just set up a quickly, very easily set up the series analysis configuration file like this. Uh, we need to specify the, the series analysis just run once and go through a whole, a whole period and then because in our case, the miracle file, which is the observation file, we have multiple times in one file. So we need to specify uh, using the list syntax to specify the, uh, the time we would like to do the, to run the series and not to run to get us the statistics. So based on this, uh, this two, um, uh, uh, set up, then we actually can handle this kind of issue. And also, 
uh, like here I show the I need to uh, specify the environmental variables for the templates for my uh, for our analysis files and the the mirror two files. So based on this configuration, Metas will actually get the uh, create this kind of list uh, in the wrong directory. So as you can see, the left column is uh, uh, our NARA one uh, the analysis file uh, every six hour, and then the, for the first, uh, and then the right hand side is the MIR two file, which contains uh, uh, contains uh, the first days uh, the analysis field from MIR two in the first day. Then based on this, uh, the file uh, the main path can extract the data properly. The time for corresponding time data properly in uh, with using the three analysis wrapper. So it actually saves our effort to uh, for the additional pre-processing steps to split the MIR2 file into the single time file. Then it actually really saves our time. Yeah. Yeah. And then here is the next example about the for the regional part uh, profiles and the time series evaluation. So the, here you can see the left hand side, you can see the two uh, regions, uh, vertical uh, mixing ratio, errors of mixing ratio profiles for dust aerosols and uh, the uh, hydrophilic organic carbon over the Russian region. So we actually uh, use a gem mix mix file to for um, bunch of uh, areas like I show here. And also I showed another one is for the simulated ALD comparison with the, for the uh, North Africa region and the Russian region for the uh, comparison between the, our uh, product and the uh, MIR2 and can see our results. And as you can see, we actually, the narrow one can provide a compatible result of, uh, with the in R2 and can see us product. So in this um, in this part, we actually own, uh, it's very very straightforward compared to the series analysis. Uh, we uh, we actually just use a grid state to calculate the SL1 and SL2 statistics, and then we apply the state analysis to dump the draw for each region. And like I said before, we for each region, we pre-generate the mix files with this kind of uh, uh, with this kind of comments to create the mix files. So the the first line is here uh, that is uh, used for the channel region, like a tropical region or North America uh, North Hemisphere region. That we need just need to specify the minimum latitude and the late, uh, maximum latitude. And then you can create the mix file for this kind of channel region. And then we also, for other uh, uh, polybox uh, region, you just need to specify the uh, the corner of the poly, uh, the box, and then you can create the uh, mix file for that particular region. And right now we actually just use the Python scripts to extract the the F bar and O bar, which is the mean of the focus file and the mean of the observation, the values in the state analysis results, and for the simulated LDs and the error mixing ratios for at each pressure layer. So the what I showed before for the uh, for this uh, this kind of evaluation. So here is my summary. So basically our uh, the this database system uh, ensemble variation DA system has been developed and produced the uh, aerosol analysis for 2016. And then this DA system we also produce, uh, produces uh, near real time aerosol analysis for gas aerosols at, at GSL since last year. And also, um, right now, we also have other uh, ongoing efforts for this system, like uh, how we define the errors of background error as mentioned, which is currently undergoing in at NSAID ENC. 
And for regarding the evaluation part, I consider in, we may extend the evaluation for the error name measurement with uh, Yoda to NC or ASCII to NC, which is also uh, I think uh, somehow available in the map class already. So we can invest some time to uh, to get this available in our package. And the last, last point is um, I would say uh, the current the help and support from the GitHub discussion and the may help is really uh, it's really helpful and uh, especially when users may get lost in the web page. There are too many details inside in the web page and sometimes it's hard to find where is the information we actually need it. Yep, that's all I have today. Uh, thank you everyone. Well, thank you, Shui. That was a, a great presentation and I can definitely tell you that I'll be using some of the enhancements to Met Plus uh, for the series analysis that you mentioned. So um, thank you for mm -hmm. discussing that. Um, in the efforts of um, keeping on track, if there's any questions um, regarding this presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm sure she would be happy to, to answer them. Um, but yeah. we will now move on uh, to Perry's talk. So uh, Perry Schaffrin is up next, and he'll be talking about using MetPlus to evaluate performance in air quality models. Let's throw it over to you, Perry. Okay. It is time to do the thing of sharing my screen. I'll cross my fingers. <laughs> Yes, my computer has uh, tended to be a little slow in that aspect, uh, but it is coming up, I, am, I think. La, 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 la. Right, so yeah. Oh, there we go, I'm seeing it now. Yeah. I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that, then I'm actually going to go to the first slide, instead of the middle slide, and ask you if you can see the entire screen. It looks fantastic. Good Excellent. <clears throat> so yes, um, we're going to talk about uh, Met Plus to evaluate performance in air quality models. We we produce a lot of air quality stuff in our uh, in EMC, um, and given the time allotted, I really can't go into tremendous detail of, of, over everything we do. So this is going to be a relatively high um, high level. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the other folks who do air quality verification, uh, Ho Chun Huang. Partha Bedacharji, uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that name right, but uh, they, they also do a lot of air quality verification as well in, in EMC, and they use some of these same tools as well. So um, as we all know, verification and validation, uh, very important in uh, both air quality models and the meteorology that drives the air quality models. We're not going to talk about the meteorology here. Um, we talk a lot about that we talk about MET Plus in general. So uh, MET Plus has been adapted uh, thanks to the help of um, people like John HD and George McCabe helping me some years back to uh, create, uh, to, to uh, adapt MET Plus to uh, verify air quality stuff. And so we have, as you see, we have several quantities that verify, uh, that, we, that we verify um, from various models, the CMAC, which is uh, the Community Multiscale Air Quality Model. It's a model that um, uh, does ozone and uh, uh, PM 2.5 or 2.5 micron particulate matter, as well as the uh, total aerosol optical depth or AOD. Um, we have also added into a couple of our meteorological models, the RAP and the HER, uh, a smoke AOD uh, output. In fact, the 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 smoke from the wrap is the same smoke that used to be in the uh, high split, which currently still verifies dust, which you're not getting into today. Um, the the GEFS aerosol, um, the aerosol component of the uh, global ensemble forecast system, also does PM and uh, total AOD as well. Um, and so we're going to create uh, this. Basically, give a description of the tools and some examples of what we can see. Um, when, uh, from the from the tools here. Um, so this particular grid with the circles here is for basically for ozone. We have the uh, forecast data, which goes directly into a point stat, and the uh, the buffer point data, which comes from the EPA's Air Now data set, which contains both ozone and particulate matter. We run that through PB2NC. 
Um, we, we get a, a point in SCDF ob observation file, and it goes right into point stat. And then um, we run that through stat analysis just basically to gather the job so we have verification for a full day. And uh, a lot of this I just mentioned earlier, we have surface phase ozone, surface 2.5 micron particulate matter. We also verify it uh, on, we have hourly uh, uh, ozone. We also have an eight hour ozone average, which we verify every hour starting from eight hours on through the forecast, which currently is a 72 hour forecast. Uh, we also have a daily maximum uh, for ozone and a, a daily average uh, for both ozone and PM. And we, very, and we have all sorts of different metrics and plots that we can do. Uh, we can do RMS and mean error with a time series or a diurnal or a die off. They're the same, same thing, different name. Um, CSI plot, frequency biases and, and the, coming from the CTCs. And also, uh, this is just a small sampling of some of the things that we can verify. So in PB2NC, uh, and this is basically we're summarizing for both ozone and PM, although they are actually separate runs. But um, currently, we, as we say, we're beginning the EPA you know, observa observations, which are in prep buffer. Uh, eventually, that will come to us in ASCII. And uh, uh, the good folks at DTC are helping us to uh, ingest the ASCII files as we speak. Um, but for now, it's still in a prep buffer. And so we're still using PB and TNC. And so we just, um, in the buffer variable list, we just bring in uh, COPO, uh, which is for ozone and COPO PM. And this stands for something I don't quite remember. But the important, important part is that this is the ozone value. This is the PM value. Everything else that, um, you know, from uh, PB2NC that you would find maybe in the, uh, in the, docu in the uh, read the docs met plus met documentation is basically uh, not any different than an ordinary uh, run for PB2NC. So this is just what we bring in for ozone. And so here is where we run point stat, which um, brings in the PB2NC data. Um, and we bring in uh, the ozone, or if you're running for PM, it would be this variable. And this, these are the GRIB names that uh, CMAC uses uh, for either ozone or PM. We either take a uh, one hour average and notice the A means this is an average. And it should be noted that uh, in the world of air quality, averages are backward averages. So when we say A1, if the time of a variable, if the time of the model or the run says it's 5Z, that means an average from 4Z to 5Z, for example. We also do uh, eight hour averages as well. Um, and that would be, um, you would put an A8 there for an an eight hour average. Um, and so there's also this conversion value so we can convert the OBS to the same unit as the uh, model. So that's basically the only unusual part in, in points that, and once you do that, um, oh, I should mention about the maximum and average. Um, we, 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 we most often do a daily averages uh, required for validation and for EBS purposes, which Jason um, Levitt talked about earlier on, uh, we're going to verify the daily eight hour maximum of ozone, um, that our, the, the maximum daily eight hour value and the daily 24 hour average of PM. So there you go. Um, and as we said, a daily average is um, for air quality purposes, uh, goes from 5z to 5z as the as the uh, the backward averages ending time. So that's a, so all your averages, all your sums, all your maximums are calculated during this particular time period. Uh, and so you need to have two two buffer files in order to, to uh, calculate those averages. So that's basically the extent of the CMEC that we do. And uh, oh, I I forgot I should notice here's how we they do the average. This time summary for the hourly is, is done as false because we necessarily need it. But for the averages, we have to set the time where you're beginning and end. Uh, it's 5Z to 5Z, as I said, except for the eight hour because it's a, because of, of, of the backward averaging, it actually, this period ends at 12Z. Um, and um, 24 hours a day at hour, we look at every hour for both ozone and PM. 
and we want to verify the maximum and the, uh, the daily max and the daily mean. So that's how that's how that calculates the mean and the max. Those variables are just automatically variables from coming out from the CMAC. So there's no special uh, massaging needed for the uh, model. And here's a sampling of a lot of the things that we you will get out of all this stuff that I was mentioning before. You'll get a time series um, comparing, like for example, the uh, the current operational CMAC to the uh, to a parallel um, various uh, time series here of various items. Um, we have uh, Taylor diagrams. Uh, we get a look at the skill score. We're right? looking at the um, you know, thresholds at the bottom, CSI at the side, or um, the or something like a uh, performance diagram that gives you a look at the skill uh, probably detection here and uh, success and ratio here, and uh, all all these various things give you a general idea of how how your model is doing. Next, I want to talk about aerosol optical depth, which uh, comes to us in several flavors. Um, CMEC, as I mentioned, is total AOD, whereas the uh, RAP and HER only output the smoke AOD. Uh, for the time being, uh, we are we currently verify against two different kinds of satellites, VIRS and GOES. Um, they're basically different grids. They're different types of, uh, they come to us in different grids. Um, and we also, in the future, are going to do verification against Aeronet, but that's something that hasn't been developed yet, at least in my case, uh, for CMEC or Rep or HER. Um, and each of the satellite requires a different method to put the data on the same grid as the modeled AOD. And I'm going to demonstrate this. This is for the VIRS. The VIRS is just a regular gridded analysis uh, data set. Um, and so we have to run that through regrid data plane. So it's on the same grid as either RAP or HER or CMAC. They all are very, each, each of those is a different grid. And so we wanna make sure that the, the data is on the, the same grid as the, the forecast data. And so they both go through grid stat. Um, so that, so we, and then the um, out, out comes the NetCDF file um, or the ASCII stat analysis. Um, and then we get our output stats. So regrid data plane is a great tool if for uh, putting your any any um, observed grid onto the grid that you want, are particularly want to verify. So everything is verifying on the same grid. And so, for example, in this you, this you would take you uh, basically would you have an input file field name, you have an output file name or field name. This one is high quality AOD for a one hour average. And here you want to make sure that you, you give it a file that you want it to grid to. So this is particular thing I'm circling here is the uh, is a uh, CMAC um, AOD file. Um, you take out the input uh, directory, you take the output directory, and then you want to give it a name for what the output. And so this is what that looks like. It's AOD on AQM uh, for VIRS. And so this is what regrid data plane does for you. However, Perry, for go, a, there's a few minutes left, Perry. So think about wrapping up. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Oh, you're good. You're uh, still, you still can. Well, okay. Um, for the for go, you have point obs, which goes through a which goes through a program called point to grid, uh, which I believe was developed specifically for satellite observations. Uh, then then you get your data, and the grid stat is still the same. And so here's what point to grid looks like. It's very similar. You want to make sure that you have a um, your, your grid. This this just pick your examples for the rep, um, and then that's then you get your um, output uh, AOD file to verify specifically for rep. And then if you want to do it for her, give this a her fi her file name, and uh, that's how you do it for that. Your grid stat looks kind of like this for the forecast. You get just just basically give it you know your thresholds. And make sure that you're doing it for the total atmosphere. Um, this is um, you also want to make sure that if you want, if you have missing observations that they're labeled a certain number, you get rid of them so you, they're not included in the verification. And you get stuff that looks like this. We get some time series or a CSI plot. Um, Gaps aerosol. 
is uh, not necessarily my bailiwick, but I know that we do it. Um, it is very similar. It, it, it verifies against satellites and various sources, and it gives you some plots like this, which is, um, and more plots like this. You get tail diagrams. Um, part that creates some horizontal area maps using series analysis. So great stuff. So Matt Plus can verify all sorts of air quality items, such as ozone, PM, AOD, um, both total and smoke. Uh, you get many different types of plots, uh, not only hourly, but daily means and daily averages. So great to have a versatile tool like Met and Met Plus, uh, which has been modified to help create and plot these items. And so uh, that is all I have. And um, I'll take a question or two if there are any. Well, Perry, excellent talk. It was great to see a, a wide range of tools being used for the, the aerosol verification. I know I personally have a question. I'll follow up with you after this. Um, okay. That was a great okay. talk. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat just so we can keep chugging along. Um, but uh, thank you again, Perry. Um, and like I said, I'll be following up, I know for sure. But that thank was great. You. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so then moving along, we're going to go on to Eva Nagy, who will be talking about evaluating lake effect zone representation in climate models using MET+. Plus. Are here. you able to hear me OK? I can hear you, and I can see your slides right now. Perfect. Well, I'm just going to get started because I have a lot of slides, but I timed it, and I was exactly at 13 minutes. So yeah, my name is Eva Nagy, and I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, but I'll be presenting on work that I did with the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Team, or GLISA, which is a NOAA-funded regional group out of the University of Michigan that's dedicated to helping local decision makers adapt to climate change in the Great Lakes region. And I'm going to be presenting a unique way that we use MET to analyze the lake effect precipitation in climate models. So I'll first just be going through the motivation for the work and then the methods and the data that we're using and then how we use MET with that data and then some final remarks. So yeah, the Great Lakes is home to almost 35 million people and 25% of the Earth's fresh water. And it has very unique geography compared to the rest of North America um, that greatly affects the weather and climate of the region with one example being the lake effect, which causes heavy snow and precipitation on the Eastern side of all of the lakes um, in the winter due to the cold air masses that pass over the warm lakes. And GLISA specifically is evaluating climate models to determine if they're credible and reliable um, for users in the region. And the first part of this project evaluated the lake physics in various climate models. And first, so um, we'll be using those models. And then first, I'll briefly be going through how we determined if the model simulated lake effect. And then finally, how we used MET to actually quantify how well the model simulated lake effects. So this is what our observational data set looks like um, for average winter precipitation. And we use the 20 year average. We're using the University of Delaware data set for observations as it was one of the few data sets that provides gridded coverage in both the US and Canada. And this is, um, well, next we wanted a way to define lake effect zones because most studies just use an arbitrary definition such as like 80 kilometers downwind of the lakes. So to do this, we ended up using a k-means clustering method on the data, which allowed us to have a quantified consistent approach without needing to set any parameters other than the amount of clusters. And after some trial and error, we went, we decided to use four clusters where the third and the fourth cluster, which are the darker blues, are the strongest lake effect. And for the purpose of this presentation, we will be calling the fourth cluster or the darkest blue, the lake effect zone. So here at the top, you can see the dark blue over here is um, like a lake effect zone for on the east side of Lake Superior. And over here, the really light green, which is just a cluster one, is non-lake effect, is a non-lake effect zone. And so we wanted to compare the observational data set, um, the observational clusters to two ensembles that we're looking at, which consists of 25 models total. And they all have varied lake effect treatment ranging from poor treatment um, where it's interpolated from oceans in the global climate model to 1D lake models that are specifically tuned for the Great Lakes region. So you would expect them to perform better. And over here on the left, you can just see some examples of what clustering the clustering looks like in the models. And so just from looking at this 
this clustering, you can take away some um, some conclusions, such as uh, that all of the models have the lake effect to some extent, um, but that the strongest precipitation is mostly in the western domain or in the eastern domain. Um, so some clusters here aren't picked up, like in Lake Michigan. So we actually then also did a sub basin analysis where we just cluster within each basin rather than the whole region. But for again, for this presentation, we will just be looking at this analysis. Um, and then additionally, you can al we also were able to see that in all of the models, almost all of the models miss the Lake Superior cluster up here, which is interesting. Um, but again, these are just some initial observations we were able to see. And next, we want to actually be able to quantify the clustering performance. So then we use MET to answer if the lake effect precipitation is spatially in the correct locations, um, aka the lake effect zones. And then lastly, we, we want to perform a bias analysis to see if the correct amount of precipitation is simulated. Um, so that's not in this presentation, but that is what we did following that. So the so we used all of the models were gridded NetCDF files, and the first thing we did was regrid all of the model and OBS observation pairs to the highest resolution, which was always the model. Um, and then we put it through mostly grid set is where we got all of our categorical statistics. But first we actually did a series analysis, which I'll go through next, which was kind of a unique way to use it. And then lastly, we used some of the information from GridStat in the Python, the MET Plotly package. So the series analysis tool was an interesting one to use in this case because this is just from the MET website, but typically it is um, taken over time or height which I think in this uh, picture, which is from the MET website, it is showing um, error over time. And we actually used our series instead of timer height as the um, model cluster ensemble. So this plot here is all 25 models that we're looking at put together on the same grid. And then the root mean square error of how they compare to the observation. And like the initial takeaway we saw before was that the largest error is right here. Um, above to the east of Lake Superior because most of the models are missing this cluster. Um, but here it quantifies that the root mean square error is almost uh, three clusters too dry in this area. Um, and then also it's interesting down here in the east side of Lake Ontario, nearly all of the models correctly pick it up because some of these grids are a zero for error. And then just a uh, basic grid stat tool is the difference maps, which was kind of the first thing we were just able to look at with all of the um, models, which it just does model minus observation and it makes this map in the center. And it just allowed us to make some statements like, again, in this Lake Superior area, they were all too dry by two to three clusters. Um, this is just one model example. And a lot of them in this area were too wet, which is the dark blue by a few, uh, one or two clusters. And the gray, which would be the difference um, of zero, which means that it correctly picked up the um, any correct cluster. So in this region, we know that it was a cluster four. So it's correctly picking up cluster the lake effect in this region. And then distance distance maps, which are also from GridStat. This is an example of how to use them from the website. Where here I'll call um, a the observation and b the model. And then it takes it makes the distance maps, which the dark blue is as close to the event as you can get, and the red is as far from the event as you can get. And so we did that with our model and observation pairs. And so again, the dark blue is the event, the cluster four, and the gray is any other cluster. And again, here the red is as far from cluster four as you can get, and the dark blue is um, on top of is the cluster. And then what you do is you do the absolute difference of the two so that you can see how far the events are from each other. Um, and then you can trim it to the domain so you can make statements specifically about that domain. And so here we did the same thing. And so in the left, we have the observation event domain trimmed for the difference. And over here, we have the model event domain. And it allows us to make statements such as here in the observation event domain, since it's red here, that means that the observation has a cluster here, but the model did not forecast it when it should have. And similarly here in the model event domain, it's red, which means 
that the model was forecasting a lake effect here when it should not have because the OBS didn't. And then the blue just means that it was correctly clustered in the right region, um, dark blue being the best. And then the neighborhood analysis was probably the most useful for us because it actually gave us the categorical statistics, um, lots of different statistics we were able to use. So the first thing, it allows us to ask if the simulated lake effect zone is in the correct neighborhood. Um, it doesn't not have to be exact grid cell for grid cell. So we defined the size of our neighborhood as like a three by three. So it just has to be one of the surrounding grid cells. And then we had to define how many valid cells were in the region, um, which normally is just around the boundaries. But as you can see, since we removed a lot of the data over the lakes and outside the basin, that was relevant. Um, but the yellow is the lake effect zone and the green just means it's in the neighborhood. And for this purpose, we're saying that that's okay. And then we use some of the statistics that came from that, like frequency bias and um, probability of detection, the success ratio, and the critical success index. We used all the, the numbers from that to create the performance diagram, which now I know is a tool that Metplotly uh, offers, or PlotPy, I think I had that name wrong. Um, and I had done this about two years ago and it was just being added and Tara suggested it. So I actually just made this in Python, but again, now Met does it for you. Um, so yeah, here's the worst performing models would be a zero for all of the um, statistics. And up here, the best performing models would be in the top right corner. And so we here we put them, we colored all of our models by the regional climate model to look for any patterns. And we also uh, grouped them by GCM and the lake model. And we weren't able to find any, we weren't able to find patterns between the GCM, RCM or the lake models. Um, and no model is perfect, like the best model was just right here. But one thing that we were able to see was that, um, so the black here are the um, the models that were specifically tuned for the Great Lakes region, whereas the orange is the same lake model, but not tuned. So here you can at least see a pattern that these, the black models are performing better than the orange, which is good because again, they had the, the tuning to the Great Lakes region. So in conclusion, um, we wanted to look at several statistics to be able to actually quantify the spatial performance. And we don't know how we would have done that without MET. And MET, the highly configurable nature of MET made it rather easy to add and add models and change what we wanted to look at. Um, and for this analysis, both the spatial assessment and model bias are important. And thanks, the model bias is easier to look at because you just look at the bias and the clusters, but MET allowed us to make conclusions where only a handful of models had both good spatial performance or performance in MET and also a small precipitation bias. Um, and our next steps are to make a more concise methodology for this so that others can easily use this for um, different variables or different models. And we are publishing our results sometime this year and adding more models to the MET analysis, including CMIP6 and higher res models and mo models with 3D lake, lake models. Yeah, so if you have any questions, you can ask now or email me at this email. I finished on time. <laughs> well, that was a great presentation, Eva. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat, um, but we do have a minute or so uh, if anybody has any questions. Well, I don't see any. I, for one, though, will say that I thought it was a very novel approach to apply um, series analysis to the clusters. That was, I think that's very exciting. And to see that also used in, in with the distance maps. So um, I, I I'm looking forward to reading your paper when it comes out because I thought that was a, a great presentation. So Yeah, Tara, Tara was a great help. And I think she had even suggested that we could use it in that way. So it was yeah, really interesting to try and yeah look at all the models. Yeah, that's definitely very novel. Uh, scientifically and to use the Met, so kudos. All right. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. And now I am going to hand it over to Tracy Hurtnecki, um, who will have the final presentation of the day. And she will be talking about um, a retrospective evaluation of the Global Synthetic Weather Radar product uh, with Met Plus. So Tracy, I will hand it over to you. And I can see your presentation, so everything looks good. There we go. I almost forgot to um, unmute everything. So. And now I can see you too. So. 
All right. Um, yeah, I'm Tracy Hartnicki, and I will be um, discussing the retrospective evaluation of the Global Synthetic Weather Radar, GSWR product, uh, with the Enhanced Model Evaluation Tools. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge um, all of my um, colleagues and um, uh, other outside uh, um, contributors, contributors to this project. So the goal of this project was to perform exen extensive veracity testing by comparing the GSWR output to various observation and analysis products. Um, the GSWR product is produced by the uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratories using machine learning techniques. And it was created to address gaps in traditional radar coverage and produces several radar-based outputs. Um, it provides, provides near global coverage on about a five kilometer lap on grid. And they provided us with about three and a half months of GSWR analysis um, products from 15 May to 31 August of 2020. The GSWR outputs included composite reflectivity, echo tops, and vertic vertically integrated liquid water. Um, and it had um, high temporal sub hourly frequency. So the observational inventory that we included um, to use for this was uh, included the NEXRAD sites, um, in particular the, the Kadena Okinawa Japan ODN site and um, Camp Humphreys South Korea KSG sites. Um, and we also used the multi-radar, multi-sensor MRMS product. And for these two products, we evaluated all three of the fields. We also looked at the operational European radar network, um, the OPERA, and that was used to provide comparisons only for reflectivity as that's the only product that they provide. So an example of the OPERA product is displayed here on the left and with the GSWR on the right. And a full evaluation of both a traditional and object-based methods leveraged the enhanced model evaluation tools um, using MET Plus version 3.1 plus and MET um, version 9.1 plus. So one caveat to mention is that this, mm, this is comparing GSWR to several truth data sets, um, but all observational and analysis data sets have their own constraints attached to them. So following the MET plus flow chart, um, our input data sets consisted of gridded analysis data, um, both for the GSWR and um, observations. Um, we used GenVX mask to mask over the domain of the observations. Uh, and then we used regrid data plane to regrid to the GSWR grid. So grid stat was used for more traditional verification. Um, and mode was used to diagnose and compare objects in the um, reflectivity echo top and vil um, fields at various thresholds. And then the ASCII output was loaded into the MET database to create um, various uh, plots in the, uh, the MET viewer using MET viewer. And then, so MET plus was used extensively for this evaluation and it provided opportunities for new functionalities to be included. So first off, the OPERA data is um, provided on a Lambert azimuthal equal area grid projection in HDFI format. So MET does not currently support this grid projection, and it does also does not um, uh, support the HDFI format, um, but it does support ways to use Python embedding to read in the non-supported data formats. So outcomes from this are that support for the Lambert as methyl equal area grid projection has been developed and it will be included in a future community release of MET. And as, for, as far as the HDF5 format, it can be ingested into MET with a Python script. So another thing to mention is that the native, GS, native GSWR data, uh, which is in GeoTIFF format, is not supported by MET. Um, uh, but they graciously provided us with um, the data set in NetCDF. Um, but there were some issues with the grid being irregular. For example, the lat and lawns were not evenly spaced. So an outcome of that was that a bug was discovered in versions of MET prior to version 10, and a Python script was created to correct for the irregular lat lawn grid projection. So we use the GridStat tool to calculate statistics for traditional verification approach, approaches. Um, 
such as the frequency bias or Gilbert skill score. Um, and these require an analysis or forecast to be perfect in space and time. Um, and they don't account for spatial errors. So more advanced methods were also used that examine performance as a function of um, spatial scale. And those include the fraction skill score. So if you look at this figure here in the bottom, um, for the neighborhood method using fraction skill score, if you were to do a grid to grid comparison, so this you know, black square um, where the um, forecast field is on the left and the observation field is on the right, you would conclude that there is poor forecast skill. But if you use different neighborhoods, for example, the three by three or the five by five um, uh, dash boxes, then um, your forecast shows more skill, um, particularly, particularly with the five by five box, uh, which has the same number of um, events forecasted. So one thing that this neighborhood method does not account for is the, um, the spatial structure of a forecast object. Um, and so that's where the object-based verification um, comes in handy. So we use the, mo the, the method for um, object-based diagnostic evaluation mode tool um, and that's a feature-based verification approach that identifies and matches objects in two fields. Um, it provides uh, information related to object coverage area, uh, displacement, orientation, and, um, and uh, intensity. So object identification and matching and merging is also highly configurable based on user needs. And it also allows for calculating both traditional type verification as well as uh, diagnostic type verification. So the results I'll be presenting will provide um, a snapshot of both the more traditional verification and object-based verification. Um, and that'll be for the European radar network, the OPERA network of composite reflectivity. So first we'll look briefly at some traditional neighborhood verification metrics. So these are time series plots by valid hour of Gilbert skill score on the left and fraction skill score on the right for composite reflectivity, and that's aggregated over the full period. Uh, for the Gilbert skill score, the different line colors uh, represent different reflectivity thresholds. And what we see is that for higher, uh, that higher skill is observed um, for the lower thresholds where a perfect skill holds a value of one. Uh, for a fraction skill score, the solid line is the uh, neighborhood of five grid squares and the dashed line is the neighborhood of nine grid squares um, for a threshold of greater than or equal to 20 dBZ. And um, it's no surprise um, that we see higher skill with the larger neighborhoods at all valid times. So here we're showing a time series by valid hour of frequency bias um, composite re for composite reflectivity um, for various thresholds, uh, where a value of one is unbiased. So at all valid times, um, they're all below one, so they all have a statistically significant low frequency bias. Um, and the bi bias does decrease um, as a threshold increases with values approaching near zero um, with a threshold greater than or equal to 50 dBZ. So now switching to um, object-based verification using the mode tool and MET. Um, for configuration settings, a convolution threshold of uh, greater than or equal to 20 dBZ was used, a radius of five grid squares and an area threshold of five grid squares as well. So this is an example of the graphics that are output from mode. Um, it is a composite reflective, it is a composite reflectivity um, greater than or equal to 20 uh, dBZ for a single time. So here we're seeing the GSWR objects um, on the left and the upper objects on the right. And on the top um, are the raw fields that are into, sorry, ingested <laughs> into mode. And the bottom panels are the objects generated by mode. Um, so looking at the plots of mode objects, um, um, objects of the same color uh, between the GSWR and opera are match objects. Um, any royal blue objects, such as the ones here, um, are considered fa false alarms. And um, any of the uh, uh, blue objects in the uh, observations are considered misses. 
Uh, the black outlines around the clusters are indicate indicate that those objects are merged. So the mode output graphics are also uh, presented in a way that we can visually see how well the objects match spatially. So here, um, the GSWR objects are plotted with the um, upper object outlines in this case. Um, so there is a fair amount of over overlap seen um, with these objects, uh, with exception to some of the er areas, um, such as the northern UK here, where observation objects um, covers more area. Um, Finland, where the objects are you know, displaced in different shapes, and in the uh, northeast of the Adriatic Sea, where the GSWR object area is larger. So mode output also includes additional output, such as um, this table displayed um, here, which contains a summary of the matched cluster object pairs. So the numbers in the first column um, match the object numbers in the bottom panels in this graphic. So diagnostic information is listed for each pair and includes things like centroid distance, object areas, um, intersection, percentiles, and so on. And then the last column here um, is the total interest, um, which ranges from zero to one with values near zero indicating very little relation um, of the match pair and values near one indicating that the match pair are very similar. Uh, for this example, all object pairs uh, show a relatively high interest value. And Tracy, um, we're nearing time. So if you want to think about wrapping up, that'd be great. So just looking quickly at um, ob objective object-based verification of GSWR uh, versus OPERA. Uh, these are plots of mode object counts on the left and mode object area on the right for a threshold fold greater than uh, uh, 20 dBz aggregated across the fold period. So uh, time series of object counts by valid hours show that the GSWR in blue and OPERA in black have similar distributions with the highest number of objects from about 12 to 16 UTC. Um, however, GSWR produces about half of the objects as OPERA. Object areas are depicted in the box plots um, in the left panel. Um, and with this plot, we see that GSWR objects are typ typically larger in area compared to objects identified in OPERA. So from this slide, we gather that the GSWR produces objects that are fewer, but larger compared to OPERA. And then finally, we have the 90th percentile intensities on the left and the centroid displacement on the right of these objects. So in terms of intensity, the GSWR events are weaker compared to OPERA. However, during peak intensity from 12 to 16, uh, they match more closely. So in terms of centroid displacement, the west to east displacement is in red, where a negative value um, corresponds to um, a western displacement and the south north displacement is in blue, um, where a negative value indicates a southern displacement. So at all valid times, we see that the GSWR exhibits a slight southwestern displacement compared to OPERA. And just to summarize, so we performed a comprehensive veracity testing using the MetBus on a 3.5 month sample of GSWR analyses. We looked at traditional neighborhood and object-based verification methods. And then overall, the object-based diagnostics provided valuable information that can help, um, help inform uh, the development of the GSWR product. And that is all I have. Great. Well, thank you, Tracy, for an excellent presentation. It looks like we do have one question in the chat from Raul that says, um, hello, I'm Googling about the GSWR products, but I can't find the data set. Is it public? Uh, no, this data set is not made public at this time. Yeah, so this project was funded by the United States Air Force, um, and the project is created by MIT Lincoln Laboratories. Um, I will say, though, that um, the, the UMetNet or the OPERA data that Tracy did show um, is a great data set that um, up to that point we hadn't used much in MetPlus, so some of the, the Python wrappers and things like that um, are, are of great benefit still, and it is a great, great data set, so I, I did want to highlight that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, well, that, uh, Tracy was our last speaker of the session, so I want to give a big uh, virtual round of applause to all of our excellent speakers um, in today's session. I was very excited to see um, and learn about some of the data sets that are being used in MetPlus, but also um, some of the great applications and the different tools that are being used. Um, I've been really jazzed 
um, watching this workshop um, so far today. So I want to thank you all. Um, and I think Tara, I was going to hand it back to you to wrap up. Yeah, I, I just hopped back on. I'm I'm um, going back and forth between the two <laughs> sessions because there's so many interesting talks. Yeah. So um, thank you once again to all of the speakers and and for sharing. Um, you know how you're using that plus. I think it's um, you know going to be helpful to the rest of the community to see that. Um, so with this, um, this particular session is closed for the day. Um, and so you can consider yourself at end of day. Um, there's maybe like five more minutes left on the presentation um, in, the, in the parallel session. So we will see you back here at um, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time, 10.30 um, a.m. Um, Eastern Time uh, tomorrow. And um, then we'll be diving into taking a look at some of the more um, the uses of um, the plus for operational um, verification, as well as um, additionally some more like S2S and feature relative um, use cases. So just go ahead and and um, pick which session you want to go to. Um, it's included in the, the agenda. Um, I think I'm going to be sending out an updated PDF. We had a, a couple of snafus this, um, today, and I want to just make sure that everything's consistent. So look for an updated PDF for tomorrow. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you very much.